I recently wrote a custom extension for gpotter, a podcast client I use. The initial version of this extension was painfully slow to run, but I was able to make it run in no time at all after I slightly shifted where I made one function call. Hello, and welcome to Senior Code Review Buddy. My name is Chris, and today I'm going to talk about how delaying computations in a program until you know you actually need it can produce some great efficiency gains. The idea here is a simple one. If you aren't going to use the result of a computation, you can avoid running that computation at all, and your program's going to have the same output. And the same output with less computations happening is going to give you a program that is just more efficient. While sometimes it can be easy to see these cases, like storing a result in a variable that you never reference again, there are other cases that can be trickier to see, like when you compute a value for every row on the table and then you use a filter. I've got three examples that I'll walk through today showing three different scenarios where you can see this issue and I'll show you how you can improve each of these cases. I made the first two examples just for this video, but the final example is the gpotter extension where I managed to get a huge gain in performance. All right, let's jump to example one. All right, let's dig into our first and easiest example. Let's assume this code is part of some sales system. We've got this little function here that takes in an amount and a country, and then we return the tax total for that country. When we look at the top of this function here, we see that regardless of what country's passed in, we compute the tax amount for every country. Then we've got these if statements down here that figure out which of those values to return. As I mentioned, I think this is an easy case. If we already know which country we want the value for, we don't gain anything by computing the values for the other countries, as we don't use those values at all. The fix here is pretty easy. Instead of having these temp variables, we basically should just compute and return directly in the body of the if statements. That way, we'll only have to compute the tax rate for the country that matters. Uh, first off, actually, let's just make sure I do have tests here. Let's make sure they pass. Yep, they pass. It's nothing too complex. It's just one case for each. But then we'll just move this down, move this down, move this down. We get rid of this. So now we're only computing the tax rate we need, just returning it right away. And our tests all pass. So there we go. I think this is easier to read, and it still passes our tests, so it seems all good. Now, I don't think this will probably have a big impact on the code efficiency here. I do think it's a little easier to read here because you don't have to figure out why you're computing values that you're not returning. But generally, like the impact would maybe be bigger here if there were more countries or if it was more expensive to determine the tax rate instead of just a constant. For example, what if instead of this constant, we had to query a database to figure out something? All right, let's go over to example two now. All right, for example two, we start with a video class. Each video has a title and a length, and we can get them. Uh, then we've got a function here called total playtime. It takes in a list of videos and it returns, yeah, and it returns the sum of the length of all of the videos that have this given title substring in their title. And we've got some tests to ensure this works, which are passing. All right. Now, just like last time, let's see if we can identify some work that isn't needed here. It's actually right at the beginning that we want to improve. So we go through all the videos that are passed in and we compute the length for all of them. But if we look further on, we're only actually ever going to reference this length value if the title contains the given title substring. So what we should probably just do is flip the order here. We should start by creating a filtered list of videos, which just contain the videos that match this condition. And then we can just return the sum of the lengths of those videos. So we're only calling video.length on videos that we actually care about. So <clears throat> let's start this off with filtered videos equals video for video in videos if title substring in video dot title. So we've got our filtered list of videos. And then we want to do return sum 
we want to get video dot length or video in filtered videos. And yeah, because we've already filtered, we don't need any other check there. So I think that's all we need. And let's see if the tests pass. Yep. And the test paths. And this actually looks a lot simpler than before. So like example one, I don't think the difference in code efficiency in this case is going to be huge because once again, length is, it's just a quick little lookup here. But if there was like a database query or something, there could be a lot of efficiency gains here. So I think this is a good change to make. Also, total playtime just looks a lot easier and yeah, there's no clear dead work like what we had before. And with that, let's jump over to the final example. So this example is pulled from an extension I wrote for gpotter, which is a podcast client I use. Basically, I wanted to have the podcast show descriptions added to the actual podcast files on my hard drive. I wanted to do this because then I would be able to have access to these descriptions later on when I only had that file. So now that we know what we're trying to do, at a high level, how this extension worked was it would look at every downloaded episode. It would check to see if it has the comment set, which is always going to be the description of the show. And if it's not set, it adds the comment. Pretty simple to explain. So I got this code working without too much trouble. This is just a bit of a snapshot of it, but it's all the interesting stuff. But when I was running it initially, it was really, really slow to run. And when I looked at the logs, it wasn't just slow when it had to add a comment, which is what my initial thought had been, but it was slow just for every show. It was slower when it was adding comments, but it was still really slow for shows where all the files had comments. And so this led me down a bit of a rabbit hole. I figured the problem was probably just because, you know, we're doing this has comment, so I'm examining every file, so I'm opening it a bit, so I'm doing maybe too much just IO. But that wasn't what the issue was, and I, I want to show you the line that I realized was the issue. So the issue was this line here, where I'm creating the audio file. So this is a little class that I created myself, takes in two values, a file name, and a comment in the uh, constructor. The file name, I need to pass that in because I have to know how to find the file on disk. And the comment slash the description, I pass that in because if I want to add the comment because it doesn't have one, I need to have the comment. I could have passed in the whole episode object, but all I need is this description, so it didn't make sense to pass in anything more than that. But then when I looked at the gpotter code, I realized that this call here to HTML description wasn't just a quick lookup call. HTML description wasn't stored on disk at all. So the first time that it gets called for an episode, gpotter needs to compute what the HTML description is. And it is not fast doing that. And I'm making it do this for every single file that I have even if I don't use the description later because it already has the comment on the file. Now, once I realized this was the issue, it was pretty easy to fix. Sort of as we've talked about elsewhere, the trick is, well, I should only call HTML description if I know I actually want to use it. So at a high level, instead of calling it in git audio, probably want to call it over here at add commit add comment when I know I'm adding a comment. Now that we know that, like I said, the fix is really easy. I just take a comment out of here and I add comment as an argument to here. And then instead of calling this every time we're creating an audio file, we add it in here. So now instead of happening every single time we have a file, it only happens when we have a file that doesn't have a comment and thus we are actually going to use it. And with this relatively small change, my program runs so much faster. Now, are there other things I could do here to speed up this code? Yeah, like we are still looking at each file on disk to get a little bit of information about if it has the comment or not. So, you know, I could put that into a database so that we can just query that instead of having to open all these different files. But the code didn't need to run faster than it was running. Hopefully, this video has given you some hints on how to identify computations that you 
don't need to actually do at all. And you can just not do and have your code be more efficient. And this can help your code also be easier to read. If you have any examples of where you found some value in delaying a computation until you were sure you need it, I'd love for you to share some examples in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting the like button below and subscribing. It really helps the channel. If you have any comments, code you'd like me to review, or ideas you'd like me to talk about, please leave a comment below or reach me at chris at seniorcodereviewbuddy.com. Thanks, and have a great day.